He paid for all of the sins, for all of the people, for all of time. You know, it doesn't take a double doctoral or a master's work. I'm not poking fun at anybody. Be who God created you to be, please. Always boils down to our relationship with Jesus. That it, that relationship affects everything in our lives. God chose Israel. Our founding fathers chose God. Be a doer of the word. Because faith without works is dead, for real. That's religion, that's knowledge, that's intellect. You need to go out there and engage with your world and own your liberty. All right, so we're going to, uh, we're going to cover real quick something. It's, it's actually a, a simplistic uh, doctrine uh, position that we have at Beloved Church, and not just we have. It's, it is a doctrine of scripture, um, but it's something that we hold dear here, and it, it helps us uh, be more powerful and advantageous into advancing the kingdom. And so I wanna, I wanna make this real clear so that everybody here can be on the same page. To the degree that we're operating in unity in what we believe is to the degree that we get to punch the enemy in the face and keep him away from all of our stuff. You're in, uh, you are in perfect, perfect, right standing relationship with God. Amen. And I know a bunch of you are like, the ones, especially the ones that didn't say amen, you're like, yeah, but pastor, you don't know what I did. You don't know what Jesus did. Amen. It does not matter. You could have came in here and kicked a dog on your way in. And you are in perfect relationship and right standing with God. Because God is a spirit and he sees you in the spirit and your spirit is perfect. It was actually sealed. Ephesians uh, 1, 15 or 17 says that the Holy Spirit of promise that came into your life has sealed you. You cannot be permeated by sin by ignorance, by foolishness in any way into your spirit. And God sees you in the spirit, washed in the blood of his son, his perfect blood that has made you righteous and truly holy, which is Ephesians 4.24. I, I think it's so amazing that the Holy Spirit put that on there. He put that adjective truly holy because some people would say, well, relatively holy. Relative to what? Well, I, you know, I'm holier than Chris because, you know, he's not very holy. Well, it's not relative to anybody. You're truly holy. You are the holy. Yeah. Not a kind of holy. You are the holiness of God. You are the righteousness of God. Second Corinthians 5.21 says that Christ was made to be sin for us who knew no sin so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We are the righteousness of God. You are in relationship with God exactly the way Jesus is. Exactly the way. Your spirit has the exact relationship with God the Father as Jesus did because it is the spirit of Christ on the inside of you. 1 Corinthians 6, 16 says, Know ye not, he who is joined unto the Lord is one spirit with him. And then verse 17 says that if you have not the spirit of God, you are none of his. Which means that it is the spirit of Christ that's on the inside of you. You are as, you are as intimate in your spirit. You are as righteous. You are as holy. You are as close to God. You are as in right standing, in, in relationship with God, in your spirit, to God the Spirit, as Jesus himself is right now. Amen. As he is, so are you in this world. 1 John 4, 17. But, you don't believe it. Because we live in the soul. We're very aware of our flesh. 
Or our feelings and our emotions are up and down like roller coasters. Circumstances come and go. People are jerks. You got all the, all the weights and uh, sins that do so easily beset us, it says in Hebrews chapter 12. And so you place your faith in where you are with God in your soul or in your flesh. God doesn't, you do. Now, where you are intimate with God, to the degree that you're intimate with God, to the degree of the relationship that you have with God in your soul is to the degree that you'll experience the fruit of the Spirit, the, the adoration of God, uh, your emotions will be impacted by it. And we know that we're a third John verse two church that to the degree that you're prospering in your soul, it flows out into your body. Just yesterday, one of the gals that came up to me after we were ministering, uh, after I got done ministering, um, she's like, hey, you know, you said that you see healing at your church. I'm like, yep. She's like, can you, can you do that now? I'm like, yep. <laughs> she said, she said, I have, and she, I'm not going to get into it. I have all this stuff. And I said, okay, no problem. She's like, no problem. <laughs> I said, yeah. Like, Jesus can heal all that. She's like. Well, I know that, but I mean, like, will he do it for me? I'm like, who else is he going to heal? <laughs> like, so I, uh, I said, okay, I'm going to minister to you. I'm going to put my hand on you, and the power of God is going to flow into your body, and you're going to be healed. And she's like, just like that, huh? I'm like, just like that. It's pretty cool. So I put my hand on her, and I started to command, and the Holy Spirit uh, stopped me. And he said, this isn't an external thing. This is an internal thing. And so I stopped and I said, I'm sorry, I spoke too soon. I said, uh, God just told me that you have um, some things in your soul that are what's causing this external stuff. And she stared at me and literally just started to stream. And I said, okay, um, let's, let's deal with that so that I don't just like get the symptoms to leave and then they come back worse later on. And she's like, yes, please. She goes, because I've actually had some, I've had them go away and then come back and go away and come back. I'm like, that's terrible. That's torture. She goes, I know. I said, so these things are anchored in your soul. And so I said, I'm going to pray and I'm going to believe God for a word of knowledge, word of wisdom on how to deal with it. And she's like, great. So I'm, I'm praying and I got my hands on her and I'm like, oh, uh, some terrible stuff happened to you at this age. I said, and then at this age, this happened. And then you did this at this age, and people have been saying this ever since. And she's undone. And I said, so here's, here's why the Holy Spirit did that. It wasn't to show you like I'm like so super cool and prophetic in the spirit. I can see all these amazing things. He did that to let you know that he wants that stuff out so he can do what he wants to do. And I'm just confirming the fact that this is supernatural because there's no way Steve Castle knows this. I don't even know your name yet. By the way, what's your name? <laughs> <laughs> and so she's bawling and I'm like, are you willing to let all this stuff go? And she's like, yes, I just want to be healed. I'm like, okay. So I said, uh, Lord, we renounce all this stuff. I curse all these words that were spoken over. I, I pull these scars off. She's not allowed to take scars to heaven because you're the only one that's allowed to take scars to heaven. And I said, uh, uh, I, I want you to renounce and all these curses and all these things that people said to you. And she's like, I can't believe those people said it. Nah. I said, don't get upset about it. I said, renounce it. She's like, okay, I renounce these words and da, da, da. So she did all this. And we're going for, I don't know, five, ten minutes. And... Uh, and she's crying and snotting up a storm, and, and I'm having a great time. And at some point in there, I basically just interrupt her. I'm like, how do you feel? She goes, huh, I'm healed. And I said, I know. Pretty cool, right? And she's like, I didn't know that could happen. I said, 90% of the sicknesses and diseases that people deal with are caused by problems in our soul. And so I, ended, I wrapped it up with her and gave her a bunch of materials, and she 
uh, when I, and we went back in and I sat back down with the doctor who was speaking. I sat down, five minutes later, he says, 90% of the sicknesses and diseases that are in people are caused by internal stresses and emotional problems. And I'm like, and I'm like looking around for the girl. I'm like, he, he's a doctor and he said it. I, this is one of the reasons, this is one of our core values at Beloved, 3 John verse 2. This is why I pronounce this over you all the time because if you unanchor those things from your soul, they've got nothing to attach to. I've actually used this analogy. I don't have it right now. But uh, those of you that know what uh, Velcro is, Velcro is the brand name. What Velcro actually is called, the generic name of Velcro is hook and loop. Because the hard side is a bunch of little fish hooks, and the soft felty side is a, a gajillion little loops. If you, when you go home, look real closely at Velcro, and you'll figure it out like, oh, these are hooks. Steve was right. I'm right about everything after you. <laughs> and the inventor of Velcro figured out that if you have these hard, stiff hooks, and you press them against this other material that's got a gajillion loops in it, they'll just hook together. And you guys know, like, Velcro is, you could, they make Velcro things that hold people in the air and do, I mean, Velcro is, is, is super strong. So what happens is in your soul, if you, if you build hooks, then the enemy will come along with all of his loops of stuff. You're condemned. You're a terrible person. You're a sinner. You're wicked. You had this happen to you, and so you're always going to have to deal with this. This is attached to your life. This is the kind of person you are. So if you have a hook, then every time the enemy comes by with all of his loops, you get stuck. And then someone like me has to come along with the gift of the Spirit and say, no, that's not who you are. <laughs> and I rip it off, and then you're like, oh, I'm free. I feel awesome. And then the enemy comes by later on when I'm not around, and he'll and put more hooks on your, uh, more loops on your hooks. So here's the... Here's the productive, effective, prosperous Christian life. Have no hooks. Have no hooks. Take the loopy side of Velcro and try to stick it to glass. Does it stick? Nope. Because it's got nothing to anchor to. That's why Rome, uh, Hebrews 12 says that you should lay aside every sin and or every weight and the sin that doth so easily beset us. It's, it's weight and the sin. The sin is speaking of the sin nature that the enemy wants to convince you that you still have. And weights are the little hooks that the enemy comes by and he throws his loops on. It's circumstances in life. It's what people say to us. It's all, the, it's all the junk that life, the sewage of this world, and some of you pay for it because you get it in your glowing screens and you pay 100 bucks a month to get it pumped into your heart. And then you wonder why you smell like a sewer on the inside. Well, you just let the world run their sewer. through. Your, it's gonna, some of it's going to stay. 1 Corinthians 15, none of these things are on my notes. 1 Corinthians 15, says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. If the enemy sends communications and lifestyles into your life and you position yourself long enough and effectively enough for the enemy to run that sewage through you, you're going to end up with a cesspool. It is absolutely guaranteed. So what do you do? You don't allow the enemy to run his sewage through your life. If you got a Netflix account, you need to renounce. I'm, I, don't, I don't like to get into lifestyle things. I'm going to back up. You, you do what you got to do. But I'm just telling you, there is a ton of stuff that we do on purpose that is devastating. Yep. Devastating. And because it's world normal... We think it's okay. I'll just say this. For the average person who watches between four and six hours of TV or glow and screen now, not just a TV, but iPads and iPhones and stuff, the average American does four to six hours on their glowing screen. 
if you just did for one week, one week, if you just took that glow and screen time and you turned it into word time, one week, I will guarantee, I'll give you a money back guarantee, money back, that your life will change. But I'm also asking people to disconnect from one of the strongest addictions known to mankind. Psychology has tracked this. You can go look at the track. You can look this up later, later. <laughs> you can look this up later. That what happens electronically in the brain while you are watching glowing screens is the exact same thing that happens electronically in the brain of a meth addict while he's on meth. It's the exact same thing. They have taken snapshots of it. It is exactly the same. The addiction to glowing screens is equal to the addiction to meth. That's why if I took your phone away, I've had people, I've had Christians get beyond upset and angry with me because I said they needed to stay off their device. I told someone one time to delete their Facebook account. They quit the church. I said, delete your, one of the problems in your life is that all these people are coming through your Facebook and they're saying this and they're doing this and your, your whole life ebbs and flows based upon Facebook and all the things. I said, delete your Facebook account. She said, well, I'll find me another church. It, it was that, I mean, it was literally that simple. Not, not doing that, I'm out of here. I'll find me a church that says I can keep my Facebook addiction. Okay. And that person right now is... One of these doctrines that you need to understand is that you are in perfect relationship to God. God is in perfect relationship to you. I hope this affects your prayer life. I hope this affects your, your mental life, thinking that you need to perform for God or he needs to perform for you or anything. If you get away from all that kind of stuff, and I know I just said a huge boatload of stuff that people are gonna have to work out, but you, you, I need to at least establish this because the point that I wanna make is that Really what's going on right now in this time of humanity, in this dispensation, there is not a war against God and Satan directly. And I know that that is, that's making some folks um, really struggle. But the war is over. God has reconciled man unto himself. That's uh, 2, Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse like 19, that you are reconciled to God, be you reconciled to God. So God has reconciled you, you are reconciled to him. So God solved that problem. And Jesus, single-handedly, also went to hell. If you have never heard my message on the parade, then I encourage you to go and listen to that. That is based on uh, uh, Colossians 2.15, 2 where it says that Jesus spoiled principalities and powers and made an open show of the enemy. The Greek word there is apek duomai, which literally means that Jesus put on display the incredible destruction of hell and Satan. So Jesus single-handedly, the man, the God, Jesus, single-handedly reconciled us to God so that there is no conflict between us and God. And on his earthly departure, just decided to literally destroy Satan and the power of hell, taking the keys of death, hell, and the grave with him. And then went and sat down at the right hand of the God the Father, ever expecting that we would make his enemies his footstools. And so there is no direct conflict between God and you. That's over. When the angels showed up and, uh, in Luke chapter 2 to the shepherds out in the field, they said, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward man. Not goodwill among men like some uh, wrong translations of the Bible say. Goodwill toward man. 
Those angels came to declare the good news, the good tidings, that now man and God are being reconciled in Christ because Christ is born and he's reconciled. So now there is no longer any conflict between God and man. Jesus ended the conflict between God and man. And at the end, right after he said, it is finished, he went down to put the uh, exclamation point on it is finished and kicked devil tail all over hell, drug his sorry carcass around and put him on display like David did with the head of Goliath. So do you see this bloody pulp of a defeated enemy that I have done? Hey, hell, pay attention. My name is Jesus Christ, and I'm the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And hell said, yes, sir. That's why when you say in the name of Jesus to some demon or some possessed person who has a demon, that's why the demon says, okay, you said Jesus. I remember that guy. He did that thing. I'm out of here. That's why the demons came up to Jesus and they said, have you come to torment us before the time? To the gathering demoniac, those of you that remember the story. I, that was one of those times like in the scripture, I was like, Jesus, get him. Like torment him. <laughs> and he just sent him into the swine. They, they got tormented. The conflict right now is that Satan is crazy angry at Jesus and Jesus is crazy committed to completely obliterating the kingdom of darkness. And there's a man in the middle and it's you. You're the man in the middle. And all the gals are like, I'm a gal. No, you are mankind. You're an Adam in the middle. There's a man in the middle. There is no direct conflict between Satan and Jesus. That's done. They met on the battlefield and you, Jesus won. Amen. And the devil remembers. So the only thing left for Satan to try to get some venge on the one who completely obliterated him is to terrorize you. To find people that will listen to him and terrorize you. It's usually not even him directly. He really has no access to a believer other than what we give him in our soul, in our emotions, in our uh, in our lives. You know, uh, that's why the scriptures say, "Flee uh, sexual immorality." Flee. Think about this for a second. The Bible says, "Flee sexual immorality." which means run from as if in terror. And the average teenager will run into it. It's, the reason it says flee is because sexual immorality actually has a stronger opportunity to destroy your life than Satan himself. <laughs> that is so radical. And people think that I get on my high horse talking about, oh, here he goes again with his sexual purity stuff. Do you, you have any idea? How many open doors? It is literally the one thing the Bible says will come in to destroy your physical body. <laughs> Shocking. The, there's only a few things the scripture tells a Christian to flee. You know, the Bible says that if you resist the devil, James 4, 7, if you resist the devil, he flees from you. Just resisting. It doesn't say cursing him and throwing Bibles at him and holy water and a crucifix and all those things, that, all those retarded, spiritually retarded things that people come up with. The devil flees when you just simply resist him. I had someone say, well, I resisted him. He didn't flee. Please don't. But don't start this. But the Bible says if you resist him, he flees. So if he didn't flee... The Bible says, resist the devil and he flees. All you have to do to make the devil run, the word flee means run from as if in terror. You stand there and resist him. He literally runs from you screaming and wetting himself. And that same word is the word for sexual immorality in fornication. Flee fornication. To a believer... Hopefully you're doing the math here and you're realizing like this is not, this is not something to meddle with. The enemy gets a ton 
of Anchorage. He gets, a, he gets a bunch of his loops and his hooks connected in your life through immorality. Floods it in. In fact, the last stop on the train to hell for a person that is rejecting God is sexual immorality according to Romans chapter 1, specifically homosexuality. That's the last stop on the, on the train to hell. On the highway to hell, the last exit is homosexuality. And I didn't write it. Don't get mad at me. Call me a homophobe, whatever you want to do. It's in Romans chapter 1. Please read it later in your leisure. Later in your leisure. And you'll find out I didn't write it. It wasn't me. But I'm the one that takes all those slings and arrows for standing up here talking about sexual purity. <laughs> Figure that out. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to keep your lives free from destruction, and then people get mad at me. No, I want to be destroyed. Why are you here? <laughs> What's the point if you're, if you're not going to give God opportunity to bring his way of life into your life, then what, why, what is, like, do you think you're checking a box for God? You think there's some chart in heaven that says, well, okay, if you go to church 52 times, you know, in, in a five-year period, well, then you're on the plus side. Like it's not, if you're coming here, then at least say, oh, you know what, this is truth. It's a hard truth. It's a truth I don't like. It's a truth that might cause conflict in my life, but it's just truth. When you accept truth as truth, you're going to be made free. The conflict that is taking place is the enemy working in and through his people at war with God working in and through his people. Now, it sounds like what I just said was that we're wrestling against flesh and blood. No. But flesh and blood is carrying what we wrestle with. There's not some vapor of a, of a stench that just is, comes out of heaven as a little, and then shows up at your house and like, boo, I'm a demon and I'm causing conflict. No. The way the enemy works in your life is he sends people. He sends messengers either filled with him or under direction of him to come and cause problems in your life and terrorize you. Some of them, we elect them as officials. God bless us. God's solution is the same. The devil has created nothing. He's a pervert, which means he takes God's system and perverts it. He's a pervert. That's why perversion is always satanic, always satanic. He takes God's system, which is God filling his people and giving his people the great commission to go into all the world and set people free, liberate, set people free, bring the truth and disciple nations. That's God's great commission to his people. And Satan said, okay, that's a great idea. So if I get into all my people and I convince them to do and say and act like and then send them into the world, then they're going to take their darkness and they're going to fight against the people of God with their light. So your war, your fight, your battle, the things that you are struggling with, wrestling with, is the influence of Satan on his people that come into your life. And the light in you should be stronger than the darkness in them. Most of the time... Believers don't know that because they come up to me all the time and tell me what the devil's doing and what all the mean people are doing in their life and what all the wicked people are doing and all the things that the Satan has brought. And I'm like, has God done anything for you? Yeah, I think so. I don't know. I, you know, at youth camp, I got born again. Light should be decimating darkness in our lives. But we're so impacted by all these people. You know, there are more people that are committed to Hollywood movie stars and to sports figures than they are Jesus. In fact, there's people in this room, and I'm not saying, that, okay, let me not, let me back up. There's people out there on YouTube, you YouTubers. You guys are the ones I always go after. There are people out there in YouTube land that love their dog more than Jesus. You know, no way, nobody would ever do that, really? Let me check your finances. And if your money is more spent on pet than on kingdom, 
you love pet more than kingdom. You can say what you want. It is a fact. If your affection is more on your dog, and literally people own dogs. They put dogs into slavery, dogs and cats into slavery because they are so destitute emotionally that they have to have something that they release affection onto and they get affection from because they can't get it from Christ. Uh, I need to stay looking at YouTube because then people are going to be like, I will kill you with a dog bone. Whatever your time, your money, and your affection goes into, that is what you love. And most of us, it's not Christ. And the enemy will send these things, distractions, distracting people, angry people, animals. He'll send animals into people's lives to distract them from him. And I know people, there ain't no way this dog's going to distract me from Jesus. Really? I just watched you for five hours talking baby talk to a dog while you rubbed his belly. You ain't never done that for Jesus. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 59, verse 14. Justice is turning back and righteousness stands far away. For truth is stumbled in the public squares, and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. That's shocking. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. Amen. God is not okay with there being a lack of justice. Those of you that are concerned about how much injustice or lawlessness that is happening, I'll guarantee you, God is way more angry about it than you are. 16. He, God, saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation and his righteousness upheld him. Does anybody know what his arm of salvation was? Jesus. What this is saying is God looked out there and he was very distraught over the injustice and the unrighteousness that was taking place on mankind. And he wondered. One translation says that he uh, uh, was uh, like tearful, sorrowful, sorrowful. He was sorrowful that there was no man that would intercede, that would bring his will and his goodness and his love into, into mankind. He wondered. His eyes went to and fro, looking and searching throughout the whole earth, looking for one to show himself strong for, and he couldn't find one. And so he said, I will bring my own redemption, my own way. His name is Jesus. This will be my arm. And Jesus came and took his arms and spread them open wide and accepted all of mankind into his redemption. Verse 17, and he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. This, uh, this armor of God in Ephesians 6 that, that you should be very familiar with, it's the armor of of God. It's not just spiritual armor. It's not cool things that we make little charts in kids church for. It's actually God's armor that he's offering you. It's Jesus's breastplate. It's Jesus's helmet that he's offering you to take into his life. And I know it doesn't fit, David, but you keep growing and it'll fit. And until then, just stay behind that armor and the devil won't know if it's you or Jesus. If you're covered from head to toe in God's armor, the devil has no idea whether it's you or Jesus behind that armor. And he remembers that epic duo my, and he's not going to take any chances that he goes and pokes at the dragon and he gets bit and burnt up. So just stay in the armor. Verse 18, according to their deeds, so will he repay. Wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies. Did he give the devil what he owed him? <laughs> to the coastlands he will render repayment. So they shall fear the name of the Lord. 
and that means great reverence and awe. They shall have great reverence and awe for the name, nature, honor, essence, and authority of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing stream, which the wind of the Lord drives. You know who the stream is? That's us, beloved. We are the waters, plural. Waters is always plural. We are the waters. If you read Isaiah 60, it says Jesus is going to come do all these kind of things and it's going to be really awesome. And then after all these things happen, then all of those people that were redeemed, they will go and take the desolate places and make them, uh, make them fruitful again and they will go and replenish the earth. Jesus came, set the record straight, got everything back right, redeemed what needed to be redeemed, uh, took care of the vengeance that needed to be taken care of, got the authority back into the right place, and then gave us his scepter, his righteousness, his helmet, his name, gave us everything that he just won by conquest. He says, there. Now, get out there and make the world look like the way I was supposed to be looking like when I gave it to Adam in the first place. And I know you're thinking, well, man, what if we screw up like Adam did? You can't, because this time he made the covenant in his blood, and not just between him and Adam, who was going to fail. Jesus will never fail. If you're unfaithful, God will always be faithful. If you fail, God will never fail. If you, uh, if you walk away from him, he'll never walk away from you. If you denounce him, he'll never denounce you. You are secured in him. It's literally be the same as he gave us the checkbook of heaven, and this time, every time we write a check, it has to be signed by him and you. And he ain't going to sign the check for you to be stupid. That's why some of your prayers go unanswered because they're stupid prayers. To burn them up on your selfishness, that's what James says. He can only sign the checks that are appropriate to his grace. If you're not cooperating with him in the way that he wants your life to go, he won't sign the check. But if you are cooperating with him and you're in unity with him, he's going to sign the check. And now you've got heaven combined with you on the earth and look out double. Here we come. Verse 20, and a redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turn from transgressions. Who's that? That's you. Verse 21, and as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon you, you, and my words that I have put in your mouth. His words, your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth. <laughs> I just feel so sick. I'm so broke. I feel terrible today. I'm upset. I'm angry. I'm sad. I'm depressed. I don't even know why. I'm just depressed today. You know what you're doing with that sword? Right. You're supposed to be taking that sword and jamming him with it. Yeah. And we're taking that sword and falling on it all the time. I'm so depressed. I'm so ugly. Everybody hates me. Well, you just keep stabbing yourself. <laughs> that tongue, that, those words shall not depart out of your mouth or out of your mouth of your offspring. This is why we need to teach our children, raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord so that they don't curse what God is blessing. Or out of the mouth of your children's offspring. That's your grandkids. Yeah, you have responsibility all the way down there, y'all. Says the Lord, from this time forth and forevermore. Oh boy. I'm not going to get into the doctrine of the book of Job. Just let me say this. There's only about 17 chapters of the book of Job that are actually, you can take as inspired scripture that delineates the true nature of God. There's 41 or two chapters in the book of Job. If you just did the math, then that means the majority of the book of Job, God said it was wrong. Just because something's in the Bible doesn't mean God said it. Everything in the Bible is God inspired. Not everything in the Bible is God said. You, you need to make sure you understand this. If someone who is not speaking congruent with what God's will and heart is, then you need to recognize that that person is in the scriptures, but they are not creating scripture. And I don't have time to go there, like I said. 
but you need to get this, that a bunch of the book of Job, you know, all these people that walk around, I'm like, poor old Job, just my life. And first off, shut up. You, no, you're not. You're not anywhere close. Because he was the richest man in the East that was blessed by God, and he lost everything because of a direct attack of Satan. Not God, Satan. And it lasted nine months, and he got back twice as much as he had before. So until you're the richest person in the West and your problems only lasted nine months, and you came out on top, and you inspired multiple generations after you, don't you dare ever say you're just like Job. And by the way, in the New Testament, if the devil directly attacks you, you're not even born again. Uh, let me get back to the Bible. Job chapter 9, verses 32 and 33. For he is not a man as I am that I might answer him that we should come to trial together. This is Job whining about his circumstances. And he's saying, God's not a man. He's a God, and I'm a man. And I don't get, I don't get to tell God nothing. He never listens to me. Look at my problems. They're terrible. Why would God do something? There is, there is, not, there is no arbiter between us who might lay his hand on both of us. Do you, do you see what Job was whining about was the fact that he didn't have someone that was an intercessor or an intermediary that would tell him what was going on. In the Old Testament, this is how people were. If you didn't hear it from the prophet or the priest, you're flipping coins. That's why they casted lots in the Old Testament. If you cast lots, you're a gambler, and it's sin. Gambling is sin. Uh, okay. I can only deal with so many things in one sermon. Otherwise, it, like people, I'm just out of it. You're just, everything I love, you're just taking away from me. God comes back and says in Job chapter 38, verses 2 and 3, who is this, talking to Job, who is this that darkens counsel by words and without knowledge? How many times, well, you know what God's doing to me? You know, how, you know how God's testing me. He sent me this woman in my life to test me. I just had a guy say that to me not that long ago. He, he gave me this wife to test me. I'm like, well, you need to pass the test and quit being ignorant. He didn't like it. I don't know why people don't like when I say stuff to them. <laughs> this is God saying, whoa, 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 whoa. Who's this guy telling me that I'm being unjust or telling me I'm not doing my part? <laughs> you know what you don't want? You don't want, you don't want to be in the middle of your whining, your complaining, your murmuring. And God shows up in your life in a whirlwind. He's like, hey, uh, who do you think you are talking about me the way you're talking about me? telling me what I am and am not doing in your life. Do you know everything you need to know? N no. You, that'd be a good place to hit your knees and say, sorry, blood of Jesus. <laughs> Next verse. I will question you, dress for action like a man. I love this. God is the original masculine man. Dress for action like a man. All right, bucko, you want to talk... You want to you wanna talk stuff about me? You want to talk trash? Man up. Stand up. Let's face off. You know, God doesn't act like L.A. men. <laughs> Say, all right, you want to talk that way? Stand up. Let's talk. Let's have a discussion. While he's standing there in a whirlwind, <laughs> knocking everything to the ground. Don't you know Job was like, hey, not today. No, no, no whatever you got to say, I'm okay with it. I will question you, and you make it known to me. There was no man to intercede. Revelation 12, 10, 12, and 17. I'm going to read these three. I know they're out of, I got it, but just follow along. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night. Satan is not in heaven accusing you before God. You might be accusing you before God. Satan ain't. 
You know what happens when you do Satan's job? You know what the Bible calls you? <laughs> Satanic. <laughs> when you're accusing other people, well, if Stacy was a better Christian, she'd have a better life. You know what I just did? I was Satanic. I was Antichrist. Every time you do that to someone. Verse 12, therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. <laughs> rejoice, the, the devil. <laughs> rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the, seal, of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. <laughs> Everybody say short time. <laughs> Verse 17, and the dragon, that's the devil, was wroth with the woman. That's the one that gave birth. The woman is the church and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. That's us. We're the remnant of the church, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The devil's mad at Jesus, and so he's coming at you. Man, if you got this, if you figured out that your problem was not a single person, this is not my problem. There ain't a single person in here that's my problem. My problem is the things that are working behind the people. So if I really want to solve my problem and you are the one that's bringing the problem to me, then what I should do is pray for you to get you relieved from the power that's afflicting you to come and bring problems in my life. Yeah. Matthew 10, 22. I'm just going to read through these and I'll be done. I promise. I know we're smelling the crock pots. Praise Jesus. <laughs> Matthew 10, 22. And you shall be hated of all men for my namesake. Satan doesn't hate me for Steve's namesake. It's his namesake. Because I don't have a name. I have his name. That's why he gives you a white rock when you get to heaven. It's like, hey, here's your name. It's his name. Matthew 24. Verse 9, and they shall, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Luke 6, 22, blessed are you, woohoo, when men shall hate you. <laughs> Yay, I'm hated, woohoo. How many people have walked up to you and said, I'm so blessed? Yeah, really, why? Everybody hates me. <laughs> you should read the Bible. And when they shall separate you from their company and shall reproach you. Yay, I'm so blessed. They're separating me from them. You know, nobody comes up to me and says that. My family's really mad at me because I told them the vaccine was going to kill. Oh, I better not say that. <laughs> and I tell these people, great. And they're like, great, my family's mad at me. They're mad at you because you told them the truth and you're trying to save their lives and help them not get sick? You're upset about that? You think, you know, a lot of people like, I've lost all my friends because after I came to God and I did all, I'm like, you think those were your friends? Yeah. Yeah. You, like they cared about your life and your future? Yeah. Like those aren't friends. They just wanted your money or your affection because they're broken people. Broken people like broken people. When you get unbroken, all the broken people leave you. And shall separate you from their company, shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the son of man's sake. For who? Son. For the Son of Man's sake. It's not about you. Luke 21, 17, and you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Whose name? So you should carry his name in honor. Yeah. 1 Timothy 2, 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. All these people that are going around thinking that they have the ministry of intercession, they need to read 1 Timothy 2, 5 and figure out that the ministry of intercession is antichrist. Thank you, Pastor Bob. I'm out of time. So if you're out there and you're an intercessor and I just offended you, I'm blessed because I've been, <laughs> I've been hated by all men. I'm going to read uh, one or two, uh, one section of scriptures out of the Passion and I'm done. I promise. Oh, is Mary? Oh, you're staying after. Yeah. You're in pastor detention. <laughs> Colossians 2, 8, 9, and 10 in the Passion. I'm just going to read it. Then I'm going to have you stand and I'm going to pray. I promise. Beware. 
Beware that no one distracts you or intimidates you in their attempt to lead you away from Christ's fullness by pretending to be full of wisdom when they're filled with endless arguments of human logic. For they operate with humanistic and clouded judgments based on the mindset of this world system and not the anointed truths of the anointed one. You could spend a month meditating on that verse. Verse 9. For he, Christ, is the complete fullness of deity living in human form. Everybody agree with that? Jesus was the fullness of God. If you agree with that, then you have to agree with the next verse. Verse 10. And our own completeness is now found in him. Amen. Oh, boy, howdy. We are completely filled with God as Christ's fullness overflows within us. Who's the we? You're filled with God. Fold. We are completely filled with God as Christ's fullness overflows within us. He is the head of every kingdom and authority in the universe. That's in you. So all this conflict that's coming against you through all these other people that you're really mad at because you're probably picturing some of their faces right now, you've been deceived. Your conflict is not that person. Your conflict is the power that's working behind that person. So my encouragement to you, pray for them, forgive them, and stop being at war with flesh and blood. Please rise, let me bless you. Please receive the blessing that the Father has for you. He calls you beloved, the ones that are greatly loved. And we, he and I both desire that you experience prosperity and his type of divine health. And the way this happens is by allowing your soul to prosper through intimacy with him and knowledge of his word. I love you and I'll see you again soon.